The unusually strong winds up the Kaligandaki River have shaped a landscape unmatched on our planet. Yet travelers, traders, and pilgrims have passed through here for thousands of years. It's a tiny kingdom in Nepal, known as Mustang. But it was once a part of ancient Tibet. Today, it's a restricted area, only recently open to the outside world. Mustang is home to one of the world's greatest concentration of human-carved cliff caves, large complexes no one has had a chance to explore. Many are so high up on unstable rock, they're impossible to reach. Others have been converted into modern dwellings and monasteries. What ancient culture carved the caves in the first place? And what mysteries do they hold? For a few adventurers, the cave cities beckon. They're among the last unexplored places on Earth. And some hold secret shrines adorned with priceless art. A tantalizing legend speaks of up to nine sacred cave temples called Kabums, hidden throughout the kingdom. Two have already been discovered, dated to the 14th century, but seven are still missing. The search for Mustang's lost cave temples is the kind of quest adventurers dream of. For a select few, the dream has come to life. Testing, one, two, three, four, five, six, Pete seven. Pete Athens is one of the world's great Himalayan climbers. He's also my husband, and we're both filmmakers. The sound is coming through. You can, you can hear it on the headphones. Before our expeditions, we troubleshoot the... equipment. And since they've spent much of their lives in the remote corners of the Himalaya, our children will come with us. The first step for a climbing expedition is prepping the hardware. Because mm, sometimes the rock is so unconsolidated. World-class rock climber Renan Ozturk will be Pete's climbing partner. Can I see this? They're pretty heavy. Don't drop it on your toe, sweetie. These long metal things are called pitons, and we made them specifically for this job. Pete and his longtime Sherpa friend, Ong Temba, went shopping in Kathmandu's steel yards for the most important piece of hardware our team will use. 25 foot long pieces of steel migrate over to the workshop. It's called rebar, short for reinforcing bar. Pete's choice material for custom made hand hewn anchors they'll pound into Mustang's sandy cliffs. This is the finished product right here. It looks a little bit home grown, but they're incredibly strong. Is the Kabum still intact? Before leaving Kathmandu, Pete meets with salt trader Hosser, who tells him of a secret Kabum near his village in Upper Mustang. There are paintings and Chorten inside, or as far as he knows? There's artwork. Yeah, there is artwork. Interesting. Although Mustang's borders opened in 1991, they're still guarded by police. Pete's led over 20 climbing expeditions in Nepal, but this one's quite different. Our team holds the first permit ever granted to enter the caves of Upper Mustang. Sherpa Ong Temba will handle the logistics. We have 30 days, and yet there are thousands of caves. This is a license to step into the unknown. 24 loads filled with our tents, food, and fuel for a month are carried on the backs of 12 horses. The journey begins along the Kaligandaki River, a trade route thousands of years old, connecting the Himalayas with the rest of the world. Caves really aren't the typical destination for an Everest climber. 
I've been in Nepal for more than 26 years now. I've climbed Everest seven times, and people know every inch of Everest. It's kind of like a formula for getting to the top of Everest. I could go back and climb Everest a dozen more times if I chose to, but what's that going to do for the people of Nepal? What's that going to do for the legacy that I leave in this place? This is really, in many ways, my greatest expedition. We research with the llamas, we research with the local herdsmen who have been around these areas, and for me, that's the purest form of exploration and adventure. We don't know what's there, but we want to go see what's there. Pete will lead the climb, and I'll make the film. Our children, four years and 18 months old, most comfortable on our backs, are the youngest foreigners to come here. Renan's comfort zone is unstable vertical rock. We just gotta be careful of these big conglomerate chunks yeah. blowing off. That one in particular. Fairly solid though. Yeah, I think. A little bit of movement. There you go. We'll have to be careful though. This is a hands-on test of conglomerate. A blend of large river rock with pebbles and fine sedimentary sand and our first close-up look at the quality of Mustang's rock. Worn away by wind and water, the outer layers peel off like skin over time. For the children, Mustang is an endless playground. We're taking the traditional 60-mile-long trek route, peppered with caves. Logistically, in Mustang, it's very hard just to move your team from one place to the other. Oftentimes, the climate works its way against you. You can have heavy snowfalls, you can have extreme high wind, plunging temperatures. All those things get in your way, and then once you get to the caves themselves, the entrances may be hundreds of feet above the ground. You have to find your way in through this crumbling rock with these very big cobblestones that threaten to drop onto your head. Pete and Renan spend their first day of exploring in an unexpected snowstorm. These are bad conditions for cave climbing. And after several hours, they retreat and give up for the day. Most on this time of year, normally we'd be seeing a lot of arid country, some beautiful colors, maybe even a little bit of greenery here and there. Unfortunately, we see about a meter of snow on the ground and that's going to have probably some implications respective to our getting into some of these caves. It also means traveling up to the higher villages is more arduous. Wiggle your toes, sweetie. Lean forward, that's a boy. Lean forward, that's it, sweetie. Just getting from village to village is taking about double the amount of time that normally it would take. Five days into Mustang, and snow renders the climbing impossible. You know, when the cliffs start to get more saturated, unfortunately it doesn't hold the cobbles in nearly as well. So you might feel like all of a sudden you don't have the same purchase you had. Those steps are a step or two. We need a big snowman over here. Maybe some of our objectives will be a bit compromised, but ever onward, never straight, and we're hoping we'll be going into some of the caves here. The weather's good tomorrow. Um, this could be a chair. They call it complete and I think you're already Pete and Ong Temba find a local goat herder who knows of a cave that has wall paintings. So, on the yeah. corner, and then, you know, just follow the edge. This is their first discovery and remarkably, the cave's a walk-in. The forgotten site is across the river from a large village, but few know or even care of its existence. Ancient Tibetan texts are strewn about, and stunning paintings adorn the crumbling walls. We think they're from an era when artists were commissioned by wealthy patrons to paint murals on the walls of sacred places but no one knows how old they are. This is high Tibetan art, black line drawings on fine white plaster 
that's peeling from the walls. Pete finds a butter lamp inside the reliquary. It's called a chorten, a large receptacle for sacred objects. This one was broken open by looters. Only the upper third of the chorten is exposed, the rest buried by debris from the crumbling cave. The entire site is called a kaboom, a rest buried by debris from the crumbling cave. The entire site is called a kaboom, a cave shrine built to hold the remains of high lamas and important teachers like the Buddha. Pete, Renan, and Ong Temba have found one of Mustang's seven missing kaboms. It's just unbelievable. I wonder how long it's been here. That there is only black, white, and red implies this kaboom was never finished. These are initial drawings by a master artist. For some reason, the work was abandoned. Yet people have used the cave for centuries. These are offerings made of clay, called tsatsa, that often hold the ashes of dead people. Hundreds are inside the chorten, along with a small statue of Buddha's second incarnation. Wow. Will the remaining kaboms, if the climbers find them, all be broken open and vandalized? It's mid-March. The storm caught the villagers by surprise. Mustang's rooftops are flat and made of mud. Excess snow must be removed quickly. Each family member pulls their weight, and every basketful is carried out on a tump line. Shortens hundreds of years old stand tall against the ravages of winter. This is the highest kingdom in the world, a Buddhist jewel hidden in the rain shadow of the Himalaya. It's a typically arid landscape, but it's been rendered nearly impassable till the snows melt. One week into the expedition, our progress is slow. We move on cautiously in search of caves that might be protected from the snow. Pete, the children and I cross a pass at 13,000 feet. And make offerings of a single stone each to the gods believed to reside here. Most of the locals don't spend their winters here, and the snow makes a tough life even harder. A woman who shoveled snow for two days has badly burned her eyes. Several years ago, Pete led an expedition here to treat eye ailments. This lady's had some snow blindness yesterday. All the reflected light and the fact that they work outside so much is really difficult. And that's the same problem that a lot of our porters have as well. They don't have proper eye protection because they're not accustomed to dealing with the type of snow that we see here right now. For the locals, the caves seem to have lost their allure. Many are believed to have been vandalized and rid of their contents over the ages. Further up valley, locals know exactly where the caves are. But no one's bothered to look inside since anyone can remember. In this part of Mustang, there's no local history or even collective stories about why the caves are here. Pete and Renan follow the only trail out of town till they have to forge their own route to the cliff dwellings, post-holing through knee-deep drifts. All the while, they're searching for the safest route into the caves. Doesn't look like we should go in from above. Looks a lot more dangerous. Experts believe no one has been inside these caves for centuries. The chief archaeologist from Nepal said they probably had not been visited by modern man or within, you know, the last six, seven hundred years or more. There's no obvious entrance. Renan scouts a route to the nearest opening. 
Maybe just straight up. And the rocks flake off like cookies on a gingerbread house. Pete radios camp for the necessary tools. Hello, Long Temba, do you read? Copy. We're going to need the drill kit and some of the rebar pitons. Copy that. Renan leads 20 feet up to where he'll drill in an anchor. But the rock seems surprisingly solid. Without an anchor to safely tie a rope into, catching Renan if he falls, getting into the caves will be too dangerous. Probably just in the middle of something really hard. Do you have the hammer drill function on too, by the way? Um, there's a, like a twist knob. Having the drill on the right setting makes all the difference. This will be the first field test of the rebar pitons. On the way. You're on the way. It's a slow but thoughtful process. There's only one piton, what the climbers call protection, to stop Renan if he falls. Pete belays him from below, paying out the rope as necessary. He'll lock it down if Renan falls. Getting up into Samar, I was above my protection. So if I would have fallen, I would have come close to hitting the ground. I was just hanging on by my hands and feet, and my hands were starting to get pumped, and the blood would rush in, and that would be the point where we would have to make a move forward or, or fall. There have been some very sketchy moments. first glance, it's a huge complex with many connecting rooms. Pete clips in with a mechanical ascender that locks when you pull down on it. Pete's foot steps up with the help of a leg loop, a sling of rope attached to another ascender in his left hand. Everything's connected in here. That's amazing. After days of paralyzing weather, Pete and Renan are finally on the threshold of discovery. Welcome. This is the biggest chamber we've seen. Surprisingly, timbers are an integral part of the cave dwelling. And large flagstones may have been used for benches or shelves. The wood seems to be a part of the original architecture. This latticework bridge of timbers paved with flagstones connects one level to the next. And a wood pillar was installed to reinforce a wall. It could have been a later feature, added well after the cave was dug out. Thin flagstones configured for storage spaces and stacked rocks all indicate this cave was used for habitation. And a three-bin stone granary are what remains of a culture we know nothing about. Finally, this sink, grinding stone, and hearth area are evidence of a time when an unknown people performed cave cuisine. Yet the questions remain. Why did people live here? How long ago? And how did they even get in? The timbers provide a clue. The people were able to carve notched ladders that they could climb up. There was a bridge that was constructed of old timbers and stone. And although we had a little bit of fearfulness going out on them, they still held really quite well. 
The timber is remarkably in good condition. And then they're in a place they can defend easily. They can close off the doors if there was anyone who was trying to rob from them or who meant them harm. So while the people who first established these caves might have been very primitive, they actually had some fairly advanced skills respective to architecture. Although the cave has few artifacts other than flat stones and integrated timbers, a single spiral reminds us that we simply don't have any answers. It could be an early pictograph or the later doodling of a meditating Buddhist monk. Renan pulls the single piton, leaving behind no trace that modern man has climbed into Mustang's mysterious past. Pete and Renan have been an advance team for a larger group of scholars who arrive halfway through the expedition. A local man was sent ahead with a video camera to find a hidden kabu. A local man was sent ahead with a video camera to find a hidden kabu. It's accessible, but so sacred, only locals should enter the cave. Here to assess the art found in the caves is Italian art conservator Luigi Fiani. They're looking at the first ever footage of one more kabum, lost in the cliffs of Mustang. It's proof that the legend of hidden cave shrines is true. The expedition has now uncovered two. Five remain. This is really nice, yeah. Nepal's former chief archaeologist, Sukrasagar Shrestha, has always believed the caves of Upper Mustang would be beyond his reach. Brat Coburn, an author and friend of ours, knows Upper Mustang perhaps more than any other Westerner. He's pioneered the conservation of Mustang's most important antiquities. This is not an easy place to work, I can tell you. The dust is just incessant and the wind is constant. For the people who lived here, it was harsh, but it's also harsh for the Nepalese scholars who have averred opportunities until now to come up and study these cave cultures. The Department of Archaeology only has two qualified high mountain archaeologists, and we've recruited them for this expedition. Locals believe their ancestors carved out the caves. The only dates we have are from an archaeological dig in Lower Mustang in the 1990s that found human remains in a cave that are nearly 2,500 years old. Since then, no one has been allowed to do further research. Sukrasagar was on that dig in a region much more accessible and not at the high altitudes of Upper Mustang. This is the first time archaeologists have entered the caves of Mustang's forbidden zone. Yet another cave temple is found. For 10 years, Luigi Fieni has restored Mustang's oldest art inside 15th century monasteries. He believes the paintings on this cave wall are even older and in a style unlike any he's seen in the region. This really look like Indian. Mm -hmm. They're very fluid, they're very, you yeah. know, very moving, they're not rigid like a lot, of, exactly. a lot of the paintings that we've seen. Nagarjuna, a saint from the second century, passing on the word of the Buddha to his disciples. Here you have a three-dimensional rendering. You have the white for the highlights, and you have darker line for the shade. Yeah, this so is... they really wanted to give a three-dimensional well, impact. The... The word kabum hints at the significance of these sacred cave temples. Boom means receptacle, and ka means the teaching of the Buddha. The local people feel that these kabum, although they were created millennia ago, still have ritual significance for them. Worshipping them, making offerings to them, pilgrimage to them in some cases, can affect the productivity of their crops or the fertility of their families and the richness and the productivity of their land and their local wealth. Uncovering yet another kabum may be a blessing on the culture. 
but it means the work has only just begun. Inventorying the cave involves recording the Tibetan icons depicted in the art, so scholars can decipher the underlying message for the pilgrims who once came here. Sukrasagar will measure and draw the layout, so preservation and protection of the site can begin. It's possible four more cobblums could be out there somewhere, waiting to be discovered. Unless they've collapsed beyond recognition into the cliffs that once held their sacred teachings. Oh my God. Hey, Pete. She's talking to you. Well, that's Phoebe. Nice, you. You want to go? Yes. You can come over with us, I think. Okay. Because I don't have a harness. I do. Well, I do have a harness. Really really There's only one week of exploring left on the permit, and a local tip about a cobbler leads the climbers here. Oh. We have been told that there might be a cave chorten, there might be scripture, there might be artwork. He's saying that people say that the cobbler is inside this wall here. How many of these do you think we need? Three, four more? Yeah, two or three more of these and two of the big ones. A village headman gave them permission to tackle a collapsing cliff where the locals believe a cave chorten is tucked away. But it's the worst terrain Pete and Renan have encountered so far. Although no one's been inside the cave in modern times, the oral history is alive. One young Tibetan boy came down to us and he opened up his book and he said, all of our gods live inside this cave. And he was pointing to Guru Rinpoche Padmasambhava, who discovered a lot of the caves in this area, established one of the early monasteries here. That led us to realize that this was a sacred place for them. Curiosity is what drives all exploration, but it comes with risks. The type of climbing that we're doing in Mustang is something that no sane climber would want to do. Generally, the rock quality is really quite poor. It's dangerous. These rebar pitons that we've fabricated in Kathmandu are almost a throwback to the Iron Age itself, which makes them appropriate for the caves that we're exploring. This is getting really jingus. Yeah. Most climbers really enjoy good rock quality, not the showering of dust, dirt, bat, guano, bird poop. This is kind of industrial, gritty, difficult, scary experience. I pushed it pretty much right to the limit. I stood up on one of those pins in the soft layer and it, and it shifted on me and I almost took the whipper. Also made the mistake of trying to breathe, taking some dust into my lungs. And that was a horrible feeling. To cramp on or not to cramp on? This is the question. Ice tools for sure. This guy in particular. It's gonna make my life a lot easier. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the yeah, crampons. It's, it's always a crampon. Take the crampons, take the crampons. Crampons are normally used on ice, but little about this climb is normal. I arrived on the scene into the third day of Renan and Pete bolting their way up this cliffside. And I was automatically curious as to how much attention the power drill and all the people gathered at the base might bring. And sure enough, some villagers arrived from the hamlet of Dri about a hour's pony ride upstream. And they confronted us saying that we didn't have permission to access their cliff sides and a sacred site. Their impression was that we were coming to steal something that was inside the cave or we were there to deface or somehow defile their own landscape. 
Renan was literally five feet from getting into the cave. We had had the actual permission from the headman of the village several weeks before in Kathmandu, who said that we'd have no problem with the people from his valley respective to going into these caves. Please come down, okay? All these pins are just like wriggled in there. The locals won't let Renan go up any further. His anchors are now unsafe and they won't let him drill a new one. Hey, Brock, can you try to explain to these guys that his anchors are not good? He's trying to come down as best he can. It's just very dangerous. Getting Renan safely down is the first priority, just so they can negotiate permission for him to climb back up and safely remove the ropes. His life was at stake in this process. He had to go up in order to secure an anchor in order to safely descend and clean the route. As Brock tries to negotiate, it's clear the villagers have another agenda. Just to remove their gear from the route, the team will have to pay. They want money, basically, and that's it. Oh, I think close to $1,000 was the, was the first uh, asking price. We were very upset with them because we felt like it was extortion. <laughs> Since the team won't agree to pay, the villagers take matters into their own hands. By pulling on the ropes, they're compromising Renan's fragile anchors. And then the men pile up kindling to burn the climbers' ropes. Renan is forced to bring the ropes down without placing a safe anchor. They had kind of played this card of, this is our heritage, this is our divinity, this is our god who lives in this cave, but all it boiled down to was they wanted money. We kind of lost our enthusiasm for dealing with them. We were ready to pull our ropes at that time. The price then plummeted to a pretty insignificant amount, actually. Before you clean anything, I think we're uh, working something out here. Everyone's curiosity is now piqued. What's inside the cave? The villagers are convinced it's a kabum. Am I coming down or going up? Going up. I was worried about Renan and we wanted to get him down safely, so we ended up uh, paying them, which sets a bad precedent. Nothing even in there. Drill as much as you need to make it safe, Renan. There was nothing. It was an empty hole. As soon as I came down, their tone changed from violent to jovial, and they were all crowding around my camera laughing. <laughs> Nepal is a very romantic place for me. I, I constantly have spiritual experiences here in the mountains. The fact that these people took it upon themselves to act in that way was very dear romanticizing. Looking at it from the villagers' point of view, the Dree villagers are jealous of the Tsarang villagers and the villagers of Loman Tong, where the Raja, the king of Mustang, lives, because the Raja and the Tsarang people have all been the beneficiaries of tremendous amounts of development aid and also tourism. The Dree villagers want to see a part of that action, so that was their way of shaking down the foreigners for some money. And also, at the same time, they're right. Who are the outsiders who come to look at their monuments? What right did we have to look at a sacred monument that affects their livelihood, or at least they believe it does? But there's an interesting nexus there between the sacred and the profane. 
Ultimately, the villagers did want to settle for money. What does that say? Was money more important than the sacredness of a monument that might have been within that cave? I don't know. It appears that way. Large prayer wheels have the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum painted outside, while inside, thousands of mantras are written on scrolls. Each turn is like uttering the mantra a thousand times, a powerful prayer beckoning an open mind toward your adversary and teaching compassion. <laughs> <laughs> Sherab Tenzing's his name, and he's lived here most of his life. Pete and Renan want to approach this cave with an open mind, seeing it from the local point of view. He's saying that it's a Yuko Bog, a snow leopard. They also want to get Sherab Tenzing inside to witness what they do firsthand. It's the only way to show a local that this is a chance to explore and document unknown caves, asking, what's here and why. Without rock climbing experience, the locals have never fully explored the cave. <laughs> Keeping Sherab Tenzing's confidence in them high is key to their success. But they'll have to go without ropes to keep things simple. It's a classic Mustang cave entrance, a long shaft that leads to the first level. Wow, this is big. <laughs> the next level for Sherab Tenzing is terra incognita. Yet it's only a few hundred yards from his house. His sheer joy of discovery is infectious. <laughs> <laughs> the final, third level for Sherab Tenzing is the most stunning of all. Om Mani Padme Hum is painted in a script developed in the 11th century that Tibetans call Lensa. It is said that all the teachings of the Buddha are contained in this single phrase. The cave has a triptych of three panels. The second panel tells us why the paintings are here. A chorten with the Tibetan symbol for water on it indicates the painting was for meditation. Chortons consist of a square foundation symbolizing earth. The dome represents water, and 13 tapering steps, the steps anyone must go through before reaching enlightenment, signify fire. A parasol at the top represents wind, and the whole thing is a three-dimensional microcosm of the human spiritual endeavor. The third panel, Om Ah Hum, another universal mantra. It's unknown how old the paintings are. <laughs> this cave appears to have been a meditation retreat, intentionally difficult to reach. The lives and purpose of the ancients will remain a mystery until the team can return with permission to excavate. They've learned a valuable lesson. Every cave they enter must be in partnership with the people of Mustang. 
Our permit expires in three days, but hundreds of caves remain. Brat chooses one with a permanent resident. The current goat herder has been there for 27 years, and he said that uh, he's not aware that anyone has visited the upper uh, cave holes of this settlement. It's a cave city called Marjong, and locals say it's haunted. Legend tells the story of two warring llamas who fought black magic battles here. The Marjong Lama caused a landslide, crushing his enemy. For safety, Sukrasagar is the only Nepali who will go inside. No one wants to spend too much time here. The cliff drops off 200 feet. Pete belays Renan through a window. incredible thing we found right up in this next room. It's also hard to commit to the move. There's some incredible things in this next room, Pete. Really? We're truly incredible. What do you see? I see this like figure of a dancing Buddha character in like a whole like temple room. A little bit more. Pete carefully feeds out robe. A little bit more. He's good. Oh my god. Okay, a little more. A giant cathedral room with rooms off of it filled with texts, piles of texts. Oh my god. Renan's crawled into an ancient library. Thousands of hand-inked folios, centuries old. To date them will require finding a scholar who can translate this archaic Tibetan script. The question is whether they are holy texts from the Buddhist era, which dates back to the 8th century, or earlier historic texts about a pre-Buddhist world we know little about. It's clear historic texts about a pre-Buddhist world we know little about. It's clear the team will need to return, fully document, and ultimately rescue the texts from the crumbling cave. If we get permission to work, this will be the greatest contribution for the Mustang people. It will be a monumental job to sort through, collate, photograph, and then make sense of the manuscripts. Why are they here? in a disintegrating cave in the remote Himalaya. In the next room, a wall painting of Vajra Varai, a tantric deity surrounded by four attendant Buddhist gods. This area has been completely overlooked. This is a treasure trove of historical information, of art, a remarkable repository. So much information about Nepal, so much information about Tibet and all the Himalayan states could be in any one of these caves. It has not been discovered, and it's lying there waiting for someone to go in, find a way in, and document it. Without permission to remove anything, the team has photographed what they can of the texts. They'll measure each cell to determine how quickly the cave city is eroding. This was 23 and a half from the ground up to where he was. Pete and Renan know it's only a matter of time before all of this crumbles into oblivion. There's only time to explore one more cave. First, we'll pick up art conservator Luigi Fieni. The caves are not the only threatened relics of the past. Mustang's monasteries have suffered years of neglect. The people, they forgot about this monastery. They had stopped worshipping and performing ceremonies here. Luigi is heading up the restoration of Mustang's highest art. I was shocked the first time I stepped into this gompa because the conditions of preservation were so bad that it was really a question mark. How am I going to deal with this? It's been now eight years that I've been working in a project like this and it's what I consider the work of my life. The secret to Luigi's success has been involving Mustang's people in the process. We had to train the people how to match the colors, 
how to reconstruct missing parts. So it was really an artistic sensibility that you had to put in the head of people who were farming. And I assure you, it was a, a big challenge. But uh, once I see the result, I'm happy of what they achieved. This is pure Tibetan art from the 15th century. Every square inch is filled with motifs and symbolic designs. Gods are depicted on a precise iconometric template called a mandala, which is a microcosm of the universe, a meditation tool for the believer to achieve oneness with the world. This mandala is of Mahakala, the Black One, a great protector of the Tibetan Buddhist faith. The ring of fire surrounding his head may suggest his ability to triumph over hatred and violence. Simply seeing this mandala helps one feel compassion for other beings. To travel through Mustang is to experience firsthand our temporal hold on Earth. The landscape has been dissolving for millions of years, providing a valuable teaching for those who spend time here. The lesson of impermanence, it's a basic Tibetan lesson. We are born, we live our lives, we die, and we are reborn. It's that birth, death, and rebirth that you see palpably in action here in Upper Mustang. It's almost as if that cycle is the only permanent feature of this landscape, a landscape affected primarily by impermanence, by erosion and by change and evolution. With only a day left on our permit, we reach a hidden pinnacle at 14,000 feet. We've come here on a tip from a local shepherd who claims he saw art inside a cave here. It's been abandoned for hundreds of years, but he found it when he ducked into the cave to get out of a rainstorm. That was 10 years ago. The cliffs have since eroded. The only way in is to rappel down from above. Their masterpieces that stun even Luigi, Brat, and Pete, the most experienced of Himalayan explorers. A 26-foot-long mural depicts individual tableaus of Mahasiddhas, great historical Buddhist teachers. There are 55 tableaus in all. We're not the only ones who found this cave. On the floor are the telltale pug marks of a snow leopard. It was sort of emotional in a way because it's as if the snow leopard had adopted the place as its own. The snow leopard was the last caretaker or guardian for this beautiful gallery of art. There's no evidence of anyone having entered the caves. There was no sign of vandalism. We were the first foreigners to ever enter this cave gallery. Open to the elements is the priceless paintings are remarkably intact. Yet the pigments are flaking off and have become dull and blackened from exposure to natural light. Each panel is unique, representing an individual Mahasiddha and his attendant. They were yogis from all across the Himalaya, known for their magical powers. Some could even fly. It's very surprising to be in this, this high desert, very Tibetan landscape, and to be seeing what is almost a tropical scene. The yogis' billowing pants and palm trees tell a story about the spread of Buddhism from the Indian subcontinent up onto the Tibetan plateau. Oh, I love these two scenes. You still have most of their colors. Even the way, look here. Animals out of space. As if it's flying. And you have here the same with a monkey out of the tree, <laughs> just floating in the air. So we can guess that these are very ancient because they still didn't develop 
the concept of our architecture. Here we have another deer, maybe. Probably they wanted to represent the animals they saw here. I'm not sure about the monkey. But <laughs> this is also unusual. These red lines have been drawn, painted just for, to separate the single scenes. And you can see the monkey is just using the separatory line as if it was a tree. Under each panel is an inscription in ancient Tibetan. They will need to be translated by a scholar who can help solve the mystery of why this masterpiece was painted here, how long ago, and for whom. Luigi photographs each panel and its inscription so the work can be carried out digitally later. He'll also do a virtual cleaning to show the world what these masterpieces must have looked like in their prime. He's sure they're from at least the 14th century, predating all the monastic structures of Upper Mustang. They were probably painted in a time when caves like this were the sought after places Buddhists came to for teachings. Today, the age old treasure is a teaching about the impermanence of life and fragile art in this crumbling landscape. For us, the treasure is to be able to give the gift of the information to give the gift of the artwork back to the people to whom it belongs, the people of Nepal, the people of Mustang. That's the treasure that we see, is having the opportunity, not in possessing the things that might exist there. Each one of us has gained a deep respect for those who came on pilgrimage here centuries ago to this impossible land of infinite space. I'm a restorer, I'm not a climber. <laughs> How, what did you think about the climbing? Oh my goodness. There were a few sections. <laughs> the snow was melting together with mud. I was stuck like a cat in a mirror. Just... <laughs> 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 It's our last day of exploration and Mustang's youngest expeditioners will begin the long journey back down to modern life. How are you guys? Oh, Daddy missed you guys. Of the hundreds of cave complexes in the kingdom of Mustang, in one month we accessed, explored, and inventoried only 10. We intend to come back because we can only imagine what might still be held inside the countless remaining caves. Somewhere, Inside these sacred cliffs, where the spiritual is more permanent than the material, lies yet another cave temple, waiting to pass on its ageless teaching to those who come here. <laughs>